On May 20th, 1988, Lori Dan showed up at the Rush home to take two boys, four-year-old Carl and six-year-old Patrick, to a carnival. She packed up some supplies and waved their mother goodbye before leaving the house. Little did anyone know that there was no carnival and that by the end of the day, two people would be dead and several others injured. This is Monsters. Lori Wasserman was born on October 18, 1957 in the Stony Island Heights neighborhood of Chicago, Illinois. Her father, Norm, was a successful accountant and her mother, Edith, stayed home to raise the children. Lori had an older brother named Mark. Growing up, the Wassermans were known as a family who didn't socialize with others in the neighborhood and rumors spread that the family thought their children were too good for the other kids on the block. It seemed those rumors weren't entirely accurate, as Lori was regularly outside playing with the neighborhood children. In school, she was known to be shy and quiet, and she seemed to be an average student. She attended a special class for troubled children that didn't fit in with the rest of the kids, but it seemed she was able to keep that detail a secret. Lori developed a number of rituals that today might have been diagnosed as obsessive-compulsive disorder, though back then that kind of diagnosis wouldn't have been readily given. She would touch the same object multiple times and focus on numbers that she categorized as good numbers or bad numbers. Though her rituals gradually went away as she got older, it was a sign that she may suffer from mental illness at other times in her life. In high school, Lori started attracting the attention of boys. Her first boyfriend was Chuck Brotman, but the relationship only lasted a couple of months. For her Christmas break during her sophomore year, her family went on vacation to Hawaii, and there she met Barry Gallup, who was from the same area and also vacationing in Hawaii with his family. From there, the relationship continued when they returned from vacation. Barry was older and graduated at the end of the school year. When he left for college, the relationship ended. That summer, the Wassermans moved to a new home and Lori transferred to a different high school. The opportunity gave her a fresh start to make new friends and she had plastic surgery to reduce the size of her nose. Before the school year started, the Wassermans were on vacation in Aspen, Colorado, where Lori met a boy named Wade Keats. Coincidentally, once again the boy she met on vacation was also from her hometown and their relationship continued after they returned home. Wade helped show Lori around her new school, and afterwards they would go out in his gold 1965 Ford Mustang. Like most high school relationships, theirs didn't last, and Lori spent the rest of her high school career dating various other boys and just getting by academically. Despite Lori not having a great record academically, she was accepted to Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa. She started off planning to become a teacher, but she didn't seem to have a favorable experience at the school socially, so she transferred to the University of Arizona. Her grades in her first year of Drake had improved enough for her to get into U of A. She lived in a building that was known to have the wildest parties, but she was still somewhat reserved. At the time, she told a friend that her focus at college was less about education and more about finding a husband something she thought she had done when she met a pre-med student named Stephen Witt. Steve liked Lori, but unlike her, his focus was on his education. He was working to fulfill his dream of becoming a doctor, and that was his top priority. Lori's friends noticed that she would do anything for Steve, but he regularly prioritized studying over spending time with Lori. Understandably, Lori became so confident in her future with Steve that she dropped out of school without telling him. When he found out, he was justifiably angry. She re-enrolled in school, but their relationship never ended up getting to where Lori thought it would. After not being accepted to medical school immediately, Mark also applied to dental school in Southern California and told Lori he didn't want her to go with him. 
When his application to medical school in Arizona was eventually accepted, Steve didn't tell his girlfriend at first, allowing her to continue thinking he was moving away in order to help create distance. When he finally told Lori that he was staying in Arizona, he also broke up with her. Lori was devastated. Lori floated around a little bit before ending up back in Chicago attending Northwestern University for sociology and social problems. She transferred to a program in dancing and acting before eventually dropping out. She continued living in the area and worked as a cocktail waitress at Green Acres, an all-Jewish country club. It was there in 1981 that Lori met 25-year-old Russell Dan. Russell worked as an insurance salesman at his parents' company, Dan Brothers Insurance. It turned out that Russell had gone to the same high school as Lori, but not at the same time. Russell also struggled academically, but his troubles were from mild dyslexia. Though he wasn't successful in school, his confidence and outgoing personality made him perfect to sell insurance. Russell had asked Lori for her number one evening at the club, but never ended up calling her. It might have been for the best since he had heard her name wrong and thought she said Linda. A few months later, he saw Lori at the club again, and though she looked familiar, he didn't think it was the girl he had previously talked to, so he asked her for her number. This time, he heard her name correctly and assumed she was Linda's sister. That time, he did call her, and when they were out to dinner on their first date, he confessed that he had gotten her sister's number, but he never called her. When he said it might be awkward if he ever ended up meeting Linda, Lori simply said, quote, don't worry about it. As time went on, Russell did worry about it, dreading the day he would be confronted by his girlfriend's sister. But eventually, Lori came clean and informed him that it had in fact been her both times. She didn't have a sister. Like with previous boyfriends, Lori's world became defined by Russell. Only this time, Russell did see a future with Lori. About nine months after they started dating, Russell told Lori he thought they should get married. Lori agreed, and finally she felt like she was a success. The entire time she had been dating Russell, she had been telling him that she was a graduate student at Northwestern in hospital administration, and that she was working a job as a research assistant. It was just Lori's way of impressing Russell so he would want to marry her. He didn't seem to question her when she told him she was quitting school and her research assistant job to focus on planning the wedding. Those weren't Lori's only lies, though. She ended up getting a summer job on the Northwestern campus, and on her application she claimed to have worked for Dan Brothers Insurance for three years, and that she had received an accounting degree from the University of Arizona. The couple were married on September 11, 1982 at the Green Acres Country Club. They spent their honeymoon at the Little Dicks Bay Resort in the British Virgin Islands, and once they arrived back home, Russell immediately noticed a change in Lori. Her ritual behavior started creeping back in. She wouldn't let Russell leave for work in the morning without having put her hand on the sofa, claiming, quote, something bad would happen if she didn't. Lori had trouble keeping a job on top of that. There were times she got fired, but she would lie to Russell, claiming to still be working or that she was let go for reasons beyond her control. To Russell's friends and family, Lori seemed immature and antisocial. Lori began leaving trash around the house, and one time at a family potluck, she served rotten potatoes. The change in Lori's mental well-being was noticeable, and Russell was able to get her to see a psychiatrist. Lori began seeing Dr. Robert Greendale, and he had her start taking Theordazine, which was a heavy-duty tranquilizer. That helped even out her mood swings, but Lori didn't seem interested in putting in the work to try to solve her underlying problems. After three sessions, she quit going. Months later, Russell was able to get her to go back, but she never really committed to the therapy. Not long after their third wedding anniversary, Russell attended one of the sessions with Lori and learned that she had not told Dr. Greendale about any of the actual problems they had been having. It was the final straw for Russell. His family had been telling him he needed to get a divorce and he had always refused, determined to work things out, but now he could see that Lori wasn't interested in getting help. 
In the following months, Lori tried her best to show Russell that she could change, but her efforts fell flat. On her birthday, Russell had bought her flowers and a pink sweatsuit. She carried the flowers around with her all the time, long after they had even died. She also refused to take the sweatsuit off. She told friends that Russell couldn't leave her as long as she was wearing the sweatsuit. In October of 1985, Russell broke the news to Lori that he was leaving. They separated and began the process of getting divorced. It was after the separation that Lori's behavior escalated even further. She moved back in with her parents and began a campaign to hurt Russell. She even told him once, quote, If I can't have you, nobody will. In 1986, Russell was stabbed in his sleep with an ice pick. He didn't see anyone at his house at the time, but he was sure Lori was involved. The ice pick missed his heart by one inch. Another time, she called the police and claimed that Russell spit on her, slapped her, kicked her, and twisted her leg. When that didn't get the attention she wanted, Lori filed a police report claiming her parents' home was burglarized. When officers arrived on the scene, they found only two drawers pulled out, but nothing ransacked. Other than that, they found a wedding album that had been pulled out of a closet with the pictures thrown on the floor. Pictures of Lori had been torn up. Clearly, Lori wanted the authorities to believe that Russell had been the guilty party, but the detective never bought that story. During the time that Lori was trying to ruin Russell's life, she was going back through her address book and contacting some of her old boyfriends. She tracked down Stephen Witt, who was doing his medical residency in New York. After Lori found out that he was married, he coincidentally started receiving harassing calls and letters. On May 5, 1986, Lori purchased a Smith & Wesson 357 Magnum from a local gun store. She answered eight questions on the application, and three days later, she was the legal owner of a gun. A month later, the couple were in the middle of divorce negotiations, and Lori's father, Norm, wanted Russell to pay a $100,000 lump sum settlement with $20,000 monthly alimony payments for 10 years. Russell made good money, but there was no reason Lori needed that kind of support. When Russell's lawyers requested a copy of Lori's college record in an attempt to prove she had a degree and could easily support herself, they learned that Lori had never graduated college and never held a position as a research assistant. Russell learned for the first time that his soon-to-be ex-wife was not the person he thought she was. In early 1987, Lori accepted Russell's offer to split the profit from selling their house, $10,000 for lawyer fees, and $1,250 a month for three years. At long last, the divorce was final and Russell was done with Lori. Or so he thought. On May 12, 1987, Russell was pulled over by three patrol cars and told he was wanted for questioning regarding an arson. Lori had called the police and showed them an unexploded Molotov cocktail that she alleged was placed in her house. She said she had gotten up to go to the bathroom when she saw a candle on the table in the den. The candle was acting as a fuse to light the Molotov cocktail. She said there was also a window screen that had been cut out. After searching Russell's car and finding nothing of interest, he was told to go to the police station, but he told them that he was on his way to a seminar and would contact them when it was convenient for him. There was zero evidence that Russell was involved in the incident, and the investigation went nowhere. After years of trying to get back at Russell for leaving her, Lori decided to try something new and begin working as a babysitter. She answered ads in the newspaper and posted her services on bulletin boards in community areas. Most of her customers thought she was an okay babysitter, but they would eventually find that items or even food would have gone missing during her time at their homes. Eventually, some customers reported her to the police and found out that they weren't alone. Unfortunately, there was no hard evidence that Lori had carried out the thefts and legal action was never taken. In January of 1988, Lori moved to the campus of the University of Wisconsin in Madison. She moved into a luxury student dorm and was registered as a guest student where she could sit in on any class. While there, she rarely actually left the dorm and eventually became known as the Psycho Elevator Lady. 
Lori would stand in the elevator for hours, having punched all the buttons and would ride them from floor to floor, never actually leaving the elevator. Other students would get on the elevator and have to wait for it to stop at every floor before getting to their destination. Outside of the elevator, Lori would sit in the common room and flip through TV channels fast enough that she couldn't possibly see what was actually on. Lori hadn't stopped her campaign of harassment of anyone who she felt had wronged her either. She would call the babysitting customers who had reported her to the police and tell them their kids were going to die. She called Stephen Witt and told him he was going to die. Some of her harassment victims were completely random, though. She saw a picture of the winner of a spelling bee in the paper, tracked down the family's info, and called the boy's parents saying, quote, I just wanted you to know that I'm going to kill Jim today. By then, the harassment of Stephen Witt had gotten so bad that the FBI had gotten involved. They ran Lori's information in Illinois and found out that she owned three guns at the time, all purchased legally. Authorities tried to confiscate the firearms, but Lori's father wouldn't hand them over, believing she needed them to protect herself from Russell. During their divorce, Lori had effectively made herself out to be the victim in her parents' eyes. So as far as Norm was concerned, Lori was the one who was in danger, not the one who was a danger. By the time authorities went to the University of Wisconsin to question her, Lori had already left as the semester was over. Five days later, Lori Dan's mental illness crossed over from disruptions and threats to actual murder. On May 19th, Lori showed up at a former babysitting customer's house and let them know she was back in town and available to work. Marion Rush was unaware of Lori's previous problems, but she didn't need any babysitting services as the family was about to move anyway. Lori did a little catching up and asked if she could take the kids to a carnival happening the next day. Marion agreed and Lori returned the following morning to pick the kids up. Before she had arrived, Lori went to a number of houses in the area and left a juice box in their mailboxes. She also left Rice Krispie treats on the doorstep of a fraternity at Northwestern University. It would later be revealed that the items had been laced with arsenic, which she had stolen from a lab at the University of Wisconsin. Nobody seemed to have consumed enough of the poison food she had delivered that day to have any serious side effects. Once she arrived to pick up the boys, Lori tried to give them milk that was also tainted with arsenic, but the kids thought it tasted funny, so they threw it out. Once they left the house, it was clear that there was no carnival. First, Lori went to Ravinia Elementary School and used jars of flammable solution to start a fire. Then she left and went to a Jewish daycare a half a mile away. Lori tried to bring a can of gas into the daycare, but the facility director wouldn't let her inside. Lori gave up and took the children back home, stopping at multiple places along the way to deliver poisoned juice boxes. At the same time, a teacher at the elementary school noticed the fire and called emergency services to have it put out. There were no injuries because of the fire. When Lori arrived back at the Rush home, Marion was in the basement doing laundry, so Lori took the boys down there and told their mother she had to go. As she left, she lit a fire on the stairs and fled. The family was able to escape out of a window without injury. From there, Lori drove to Hubbard Woods Elementary School and entered the facility with two of her handguns. It's believed that the Rush's two older children were Lori's intended targets, but they were off on a field trip that day. After being seen going in and out of the boys' restroom and walking into classroom number seven for a few minutes, Lori found six-year-old Robert Trossman, who she dragged into the closest restroom. She pulled a Beretta from her waistband and shot him in the chest. Two other boys had walked into the restroom, and when she tried to shoot them, the gun wouldn't fire. Lori returned to classroom seven and started waving both guns around. She yelled at the kids to get in the corner, but she didn't wait before she fired into the group. Eight-year-old Mark Tiborek was the first to be hit. The next victim was Nick Corwin. The bullet hit him in the back, punctured his lung, and exited his chest. Peter Monroe tried to stop a bullet with his hand, but it just went right through before entering his abdomen. Lindsay Fisher was hit in her chest, and seven-year-old Catherine Ann Miller was hit on her left side. 
Lori Dan had shot six children and then fled. She got out of the school to her car and drove away, but when she saw a police cruiser up ahead, she pulled a U-turn and went the opposite direction. She tried to take a turn too fast and crashed into a tree, disabling the vehicle. In the car, she removed her shorts and wrapped a plastic bag around her waist before fleeing to the home of the Andrews family. Initially, Lori told the family that she had been sexually assaulted and that she had shot her attacker, but the police misunderstood the situation and were coming after her. She told the family they were hostages. 20-year-old Phil Andrews convinced Lori to let the rest of his family go, which she did. Then she called her mother and told her she'd done something terrible. At some point, Phil tried to get the gun away from Lori, but in the struggle, he was shot in the chest. He stumbled out of the house and collapsed in the front yard. After that, Lori went upstairs and put the barrel of her 32 into her mouth and pulled the trigger. She died instantly. Back at the school, the children were rushed to the hospital where they would all survive their wounds with the exception of Nick Corwin. Nick was born on April 9th, 1980 to Joel and Linda Corwin. He was known as a friendly kid who loved sports. Phil Andrews also survived his gunshot wound and like the children, he would recover physically. Even so, the emotional toll was huge and without a suicide note, the true motivation for the attack would remain unknown. There was a rumor that the teacher in classroom number 7 was dating Russell Dan, and that's why Lori picked that location, but I can never find a solid confirmation of that. Many people put blame on Lori's parents for not taking her actions seriously, enabling her to continue being a danger to others. When Lori was on the phone with her mother just before ending her own life, Phil actually ended up getting on the phone as well and noted that Edith showed great indifference to what was going on, asking him to, quote, make sure she gets home safely, before ending the call. The day after the shooting, Norm had his lawyer call the police department and demand the car Lori was driving, a Toyota that belonged to him, be returned. His daughter had shot seven people, a child was dead, and he was concerned about the car. The common consensus is that the Wassermans should have had Lori institutionalized years earlier. When Lori's belongings were searched, two newspaper clippings were found. One was an article about a man who randomly killed two people in a public building. The other described a depressed young man who had attempted to take his own life in the same way that Lori did, but he had survived and discovered that his brain injury had cured him of his obsessive-compulsive disorder. Was Lori looking for a way to cure herself of OCD, or did her mental illness take control of her and cause her to commit evil? Or was she just a spiteful person who couldn't handle being rejected by others despite her own terrible behavior, wanting to get revenge on everyone? It's something we will never know since she's gone, but one way or another, to the people Lori Dan hurt, she was a monster. If you're a fan of true crime, hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode. You can also hit like or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.